Volume 3, Chapter 5. After the repose of a few days, we held a council to decide on our future movements. Our first plan had been to quit our wintry native latitude and seek for our diminished numbers the luxuries and delights of a southern climate. We had not fixed on any precise spot as the termination of our wanderings, but a vague picture of perpetual spring, fragrant groves, and sparkling streams floated in our imagination to entice us on. A variety of causes had detained us in England, and we had now arrived at the middle of February. If we pursued our original project, we should find ourselves in a worse situation than before, having exchanged our temperate climate for the intolerable heats of a summer in Egypt or Persia. We were therefore obliged to modify our plan, as the season continued to be inclement, and it was determined that we should await the arrival of spring in our present abode, and so order our future movements as to pass the hot months in the icy valleys of Switzerland, deferring our southern progress until the ensuing autumn, if such a season was ever again to be beheld by us. The castle and town of Versailles afforded our numbers ample accommodation, and foraging parties took it by turns to supply our wants. There was a strange and appalling motley in the situation of these the last of the race. At first I likened it to a colony which, born over the far seas, struck root for the first time in a new country. But where was the bustle and industry characteristic of such an assemblage? The rudely constructed dwelling which was to suffice till a more commodious mansion could be built, the marking out of fields, the attempt at cultivation, the eager curiosity to discover unknown animals and herbs, the excursions for the sake of exploring the country. Our habitations were palaces, our food was ready stored in granaries, there was no need of labor, no inquisitiveness, no restless desire to get on. If we had been assured that we should secure the lives of our present numbers, there would have been more vivacity and hope in our councils. We should have discussed as to the period when the existing produce for man's sustenance would no longer suffice for us, and what mode of life we should then adopt. We should have considered more carefully our future plans, and debated concerning the spot where we should in future dwell. But summer and the plague were near, and we dared not look forward. Every heart sickened at the thought of amusement. If the younger part of our community were ever impelled by youthful and untamed hilarity to enter on any dance or song to cheer the melancholy time, they would suddenly break off, checked by a mournful look or agonizing sigh from anyone among them who was prevented by sorrows and losses from mingling in the festivity. If laughter echoed under our roof, yet the heart was vacant of joy, and whenever it chanced that I witnessed such attempts at pastime, they increased instead of diminishing my sense of woe. In the midst of the pleasure-hunting throng, I would close my eyes and see before me the obscure cavern, where was garnered the mortality of Idris, and the dead lay around, moldering in hushed repose. When I again became aware of the present hour, softest melody of Lydian flute, or harmonious maze of graceful dance, was bet as the demoniac chorus in the wolf's glen, and the caperings of the reptiles that surrounded the magic circle. My dearest interval of peace occurred when, released from the obligation of associating with the crowd, I could repose in the dear home where my children lived. Children, I say, for the tenderest emotions of paternity bound me to Clara. She was now fourteen. Sorrow and deep insight into the scenes around her calmed the restless spirit of girlhood, while the remembrance of her father, whom she idolized, and respect for me and Adrian, implanted an high sense of duty in her young heart. Though serious, she was not sad. The eager desire that makes us all, when young, plume our wings and stretch our necks, that we may more swiftly a light tiptoe on the height of maturity, was subdued in her by early experience. All that she could spare of overflowing love from her parents' memory and attention to her living relatives was spent upon religion. This was the hidden law of her heart, which she concealed with childish reserve, and cherished the more because it was secret. What faith so entire, what charity so pure, what hope so fervent as that of early youth? And she, all love, all tenderness and trust, who from infancy had been tossed on the wide sea of passion and misfortune, saw the finger of apparent divinity in all and her best hope was to make herself acceptable to the power she worshipped. Evelyn was only five years old. His joyous heart was incapable of sorrow, and he enlivened our house with the innocent mirth incident to his years. The aged Countess of Windsor had fallen from her dream of power, rank, and grandeur. She had been suddenly seized with the conviction that love was the only good of life, virtue the only ennobling distinction and enriching wealth. 
Such a lesson had been taught her by the dead lips of her neglected daughter, and she devoted herself with all the fiery violence of her character to the obtaining the affection of the remnants of her family. In early years the heart of Adrian had been chilled towards her, and though he observed a due respect, her coldness mixed with the recollection of disappointment and madness caused him to feel even pain in her society. She saw this, and yet determined to win his love, the obstacle served the rather to excite her ambition. As Henry, Emperor of Germany, lay in the snow before Pope Leo's gate for three winter days and nights, so did she in humility wait before the icy barriers of his closed heart, till he, the servant of love and prince of tender courtesy, opened it wide for her admittance, bestowing with fervency and gratitude the tribute of filial affection she merited. Her understanding, courage, and presence of mind became powerful auxiliaries to him in the difficult task of ruling the tumultuous crowd, which were subjected to his control in truth by a single hair. The principal circumstances that disturbed our tranquility during this interval originated in the vicinity of the impostor prophet and his followers. They continued to reside at Paris, but missionaries from among them often visited Versailles, and such was the power of assertions, however false, yet vehemently iterated over the ready credulity of the ignorant and fearful, that they seldom failed in drawing over to their party some from among our numbers. An instance of this nature coming immediately under our notice, we were led to consider the miserable state in which we should leave our countrymen, when we should, at the approach of summer, move on towards Switzerland, and leave a deluded crew behind us in the hands of their miscreant leader. The sense of the smallness of our numbers and expectation of decrease pressed upon us, and while it would be a subject of congratulation to ourselves to add one to our party, it would be doubly gratifying to rescue from the pernicious influence of superstition and unrelenting tyranny the victims that now, though voluntarily enchained, groaned beneath it. If we had considered the preacher as sincere in a belief of his own denunciations, or only moderately actuated by kind feeling in the exercise of his assumed powers, we should have immediately addressed ourselves to him, and endeavored with our best arguments to soften and humanize his views. But he was instigated by ambition. He desired to rule over these last stragglers from the fold of death. His projects went so far as to cause him to calculate that if from these crushed remains a few survived, so that a new race should spring up, he, by holding tight the reins of belief, might be remembered by the post-pestilential race as a patriarch, a prophet, nay a deity. Such as of old among the post-Diluvians were Jupiter the conqueror, Serapis the lawgiver, and Vishnu the preserver. These ideas made him inflexible in his rule, and violent in his hate of any who presumed to share with him his usurped empire. It is a strange fact, but incontestable, that the philanthropist, who ardent in his desire to do good, who patient, reasonable and gentle, yet disdains to use other argument than truth, has less influence over men's minds, than he who, grasping and selfish, refuses not to adopt any means, nor awaken any passion, nor diffuse any falsehood, for the advancement of his cause. If this from time immemorial has been the case, the contrast was infinitely greater, now that the one could bring harrowing fears and transcendent hopes into play, while the other had few hopes to hold forth, nor could influence the imagination to diminish the fears which he himself was the first to entertain. The preacher had persuaded his followers that their escape from the plague, the salvation of their children, and the rise of a new race of men from their seed depended on their faith in and their submission to him. They greedily imbibed this belief, and their overweening credulity even rendered them eager to make converts to the same faith. How to seduce any individuals from such an alliance of fraud was a frequent subject of Adrian's meditations and discourse. He formed many plans for the purpose, but his own troop kept him in full occupation to ensure their fidelity and safety, beside which the preacher was as cautious and prudent as he was cruel. His victims lived under the strictest rules and laws, which either entirely imprisoned them within the Tuileries, or let them out in such numbers, and under such leaders, as precluded the possibility of controversy. There was one among them, however, whom I resolved to save. She had been known to us in happier days. Idris had loved her, and her excellent nature made it peculiarly lamentable that she should be sacrificed by this merciless cannibal of souls. This man had between two and three hundred persons enlisted under his banners. More than half of them were women. There were about fifty children of all ages, and not more than eighty men. 
They were mostly drawn from that which, when such distinctions existed, was denominated the lower rank of society. The exceptions consisted of a few high-born females, who, panic-struck and tamed by sorrow, had joined him. Among these was one, young, lovely and enthusiastic, whose very goodness made her a more easy victim. I have mentioned her before, Juliet, the youngest daughter and now sole relic of the ducal house of L. There are some beings, whom fate seems to select on whom to pour in unmeasured portion the vials of her wrath, and whom she bathes even to the lips in misery. Such a one was the ill-starred Juliet. She had lost her indulgent parents, her brothers and sisters, companions of her youth. In one fell swoop they had been carried off from her. Yet she had again dared to call herself happy. United to her admirer, to him who possessed and filled her whole heart, she yielded to the lethean powers of love, and knew and felt only his life and presence. At the very time when with keen delight she welcomed the tokens of maternity, this sole prop of her life failed. Her husband died of the plague. For a time she had been lulled in insanity. The birth of her child restored her to the cruel reality of things, but gave her at the same time an object for whom to preserve at once life and reason. Every friend and relative had died off, and she was reduced to solitude and penury. Deep melancholy and angry impatience distorted her judgment, so that she could not persuade herself to disclose her distress to us. When she heard of the plan of universal emigration, she resolved to remain behind with her child, and alone in wide England to live or die, as fate might decree beside the grave of her beloved. She had hidden herself in one of the many empty habitations of London. It was she who rescued my Idris on the fatal 20th of November. Though my immediate danger and the subsequent illness of Idris caused us to forget our hapless friend. This circumstance had however brought her again in contact with her fellow creatures. A slight illness of her infant proved to her that she was still bound to humanity by an indestructible tie. To preserve this little creature's life became the object of her being, and she joined the first division of migrants who went over to Paris. She became an easy prey to the Methodist. Her sensibility and acute fears rendered her accessible to every impulse. Her love for her child made her eager to cling to the merest straw held out to save him. Her mind, once unstrung and now tuned by roughest inharmonious hands, made her credulous. Beautiful as fabled goddess, with voice of unrivaled sweetness, burning with new lighted enthusiasm, she became a steadfast proselyte and powerful auxiliary to the leader of the elect. I had remarked her in the crowd on the day we met on the place Vendome, and, recollecting suddenly her providential rescue of my lost one, on the night of the 20th of November, I reproached myself for my neglect and ingratitude, and felt impelled to leave no means that I could adopt untried, to recall her to her better self, and rescue her from the fangs of the hypocrite destroyer. I will not, at this period of my story, record the artifices I used to penetrate the asylum of the Tuileries, or give what would be a tedious account of my stratagems, disappointments, and perseverance. I at last succeeded in entering these walls, and roamed its halls and corridors in eager hope to find my selected convert. In the evening I contrived to mingle unobserved with the congregation, which assembled in the chapel, to listen to the crafty and eloquent harangue of their prophet. I saw Juliet near him, her dark eyes, fearfully impressed with the restless glare of madness, were fixed on him. She held her infant, not yet a year old, in her arms, and care of it alone could distract her attention from the words to which she eagerly listened. After the sermon was over, the congregation dispersed. All quitted the chapel except she whom I sought. Her babe had fallen asleep, so she placed it on a cushion and sat on the floor beside, watching its tranquil slumber. I presented myself to her. For a moment natural feeling produced a sentiment of gladness, which disappeared again, when with ardent and affectionate exhortation I besought her to accompany me in flight from this den of superstition and misery. In a moment, she relapsed into the delirium of fanaticism, and but that her gentle nature forbade, would have loaded me with execrations. She conjured me, she commanded me to leave her. Beware, oh beware, she cried. Fly while yet your escape is practicable, now you are safe. But strange sounds and inspirations come on me at times, and if the Eternal should in awful whisper reveal to me his will, that to save my child you must be sacrificed, I would call in the satellites of him you call the tyrant. They would tear you limb from limb, nor would I hallow the death of him whom Idris loved by a single tear. She spoke hurriedly with tuneless voice and wild look. Her child awoke and frightened began to cry. Each sob went to the ill-fated mother's heart. 
and she mingled the epithets of endearment she addressed to her infant with angry commands that I should leave her. Had I had the means, I would have risked all, have torn her by force from the murderer's den, and trusted to the healing balm of reason and affection. But I had no choice, no power even of longer struggle. Steps were heard along the gallery, and the voice of the preacher drew near. Juliet, straining her child in a close embrace, fled by another passage. Even then I would have followed her, but my foe and his satellites entered. I was surrounded and taken prisoner. I remembered the menace of the unhappy Juliet, and expected the full tempest of the man's vengeance, and the awakened wrath of his followers, to fall instantly upon me. I was questioned, my answers were simple and sincere. His own mouth condemns him, exclaimed the impostor. He confesses that his intention was to seduce from the way of salvation our well-beloved sister in God, away with him to the dungeon, tomorrow he dies the death. We are manifestly called upon to make an example tremendous and appalling, to scare the children of sin from our asylum of the saved. My heart revolted from his hypocritical jargon, but it was unworthy of me to combat in words with the ruffian, and my answer was cool. While, far from being possessed with fear, methought, even at the worst, a man true to himself, courageous and determined, could fight his way, even from the boards of the scaffold, through the herd of these misguided maniacs. Remember, I said, who I am, and be well assured that I shall not die unavenged. Your legal magistrate, the Lord Protector, knew of my design, and is aware that I am here, the cry of blood will reach him, and you and your miserable victims will long lament the tragedy you are about to act. My antagonist did not deign to reply even by a look. You know your duty, he said to his comrades. Obey. In a moment I was thrown on the earth, bound, blindfolded, and hurried away. Liberty of limb and sight was only restored to me, when, surrounded by dungeon walls, dark and impervious, I found myself a prisoner and alone. Such was the result of my attempt to gain over the proselyte of this man of crime. I could not conceive that he would dare put me to death. Yet I was in his hands, the path of his ambition had ever been dark and cruel. His power was founded upon fear. The one word which might cause me to die, unheard, unseen, in the obscurity of my dungeon, might be easier to speak than the deed of mercy to act. He would not risk probably a public execution, but a private assassination would at once terrify any of my companions from attempting a like feat, at the same time that a cautious line of conduct might enable him to avoid the inquiries and the vengeance of Adrian. Two months ago, in a vault more obscure than the one I now inhabited, I had revolved the design of quietly laying me down to die. Now I shuddered at the approach of fate. My imagination was busied in shaping forth the kind of death he would inflict. Would he allow me to wear out life with famine, or was the food administered to me to be medicined with death? Would he steal on me in my sleep, or should I contend to the last with my murderers, knowing, even while I struggled, that I must be overcome? I lived upon an earth whose diminished population a child's arithmetic might number. I had lived through long months with death stalking close at my side, while at intervals the shadow of his skeleton shape darkened my path. I had believed that I despised the grim phantom, and laughed his power to scorn. Any other fate I should have met with courage, nay, have gone out gallantly to encounter. But to be murdered thus at the midnight hour by cold-blooded assassins, no friendly hand to close my eyes or receive my parting blessing, to die in combat, hate and execration. Ah, why my angel love, didst thou restore me to life, when already I had stepped within the portals of the tomb, now that so soon again I was to be flung back a mangled corpse. Hours passed, centuries, could I give words to the many thoughts which occupied me in endless succession during this interval, I should fill volumes. The air was dank, the dungeon floor mildewed and icy cold. Hunger came upon me too, and no sound reached me from without. Tomorrow the ruffian had declared that I should die. When would tomorrow come? Was it not already here? My door was about to be opened. I heard the key turn, and the bars and bolts slowly removed. The opening of intervening passages permitted sounds from the interior of the palace to reach me, and I heard the clock strike one. They come to murder me, I thought. This hour does not befit a public execution. I drew myself up against the wall opposite the entrance. I collected my forces, I rallied my courage, I would not fall a tame prey. Slowly the door receded on its hinges. I was ready to spring forward to seize and grapple with the intruder, till the sight of who it was changed at once the temper of my mind. It was Juliet herself, pale and trembling she stood, a lamp in her hand on the threshold of the dungeon, looking at me with wistful countenance. 
but in a moment she reassumed her self-possession, and her languid eyes recovered their brilliancy. She said, I am come to save you, Verney, and yourself also, I cried. Dearest friend, can we indeed be saved? Not a word, she replied. Follow me, I obeyed instantly. We threaded with light steps many corridors, ascended several flights of stairs, and passed through long galleries. At the end of one she unlocked a low portal. A rush of wind extinguished our lamp, but in lieu of it, we had the blessed moonbeams and the open face of heaven. Then first Juliet spoke. You are safe, she said. God bless you. Farewell, I seized her reluctant hand. Dear friend, I cried, misguided victim, do you not intend to escape with me? Have you not risked all in facilitating my flight? And do you think that I will permit you to return and suffer alone the effects of that miscreant's rage? Never. Do not fear for me, replied the lovely girl mournfully. And do not imagine that without the consent of our chief you could be without these walls. It is he that has saved you. He assigned to me the part of leading you hither, because I am best acquainted with your motives for coming here, and can best appreciate his mercy in permitting you to depart. And are you, I cried, the dupe of this man, he dreads me alive as an enemy, and dead he fears my avengers. By favoring this clandestine escape he preserves a show of consistency to his followers, but mercy is far from his heart. Do you forget his artifices, his cruelty and fraud? As I am free, so are you. Come, Juliet, the mother of our lost Idris will welcome you. The noble Adrian will rejoice to receive you. You will find peace and love and better hopes than fanaticism can afford. Come and fear not. Long before day we shall be at Versailles. Close the door on this abode of crime. Come, sweet Juliet, from hypocrisy and guilt to the society of the affectionate and good. I spoke hurriedly but with fervor, and while with gentle violence I drew her from the portal, some thought, some recollection of past scenes of youth and happiness made her listen and yield to me. Suddenly she broke away with a piercing shriek. My child, my child, he has my child, my darling girl is my hostage. She darted from me into the passage. The gate closed between us. She was left in the fangs of this man of crime, a prisoner, still to inhale the pestilential atmosphere which adhered to his demoniac nature. The unimpeded breeze played on my cheek. The moon shone graciously upon me. My path was free. Glad to have escaped, yet melancholy in my very joy, I retrod my steps to Versailles.